G'day. My name's Jeremy Clark. I'm a Catholic priest, a member of the Australian province of the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits. When I was a high school boy at St Ignatius College in Sydney in the early 1980s, I first heard about a Jesuit missionary to China in the 16th century, a man called Matteo Ricci. At about the same time, I also started studying Chinese language and culture. And then I went to China for the first time in 1985, and it's been true to say that ever since those days, Ritchie and the Chinese Catholic Church and Chinese language and culture have been a constant in my life. My students at Boston College have been great. But they do surprise me, I must admit, because when they study with me, there's not too many of them who know all that much about Ritchie or about the history of the Catholic Church in China. That does surprise me because Ritchie is a very significant world figure in history. He looms large in the history of East-West cultural exchange. Chinese students, however, Chinese people at large, do know about Ritchie, do know about Li Ma Do. He appears in textbooks. There are annual conferences on him. People visit his cemetery. People know that he brought Western science and learning to China, but they also know that he was a missionary that he was expounding upon the teachings of the Lord of Heaven, of Christ. During his own lifetime, people came to him either for the signs or to hear him talk about Jesus. Some people came to him for both. What I want to do is tell you something about Richie's life and his story. And in telling something about his life and story and his journey from the south of China all the way up to Beijing in the north, tell you something about how the Catholic Church has developed also not just during his life, but in the last 400 years as well. This is not the beginning. Ritchie did not begin the story of the, of the Catholic Church in China. That began actually centuries before him. But more particularly in a Jesuit sense, it began with Francis Xavier and uh, uh, Alessandro uh, Valignano. That began down south, and that's where we're going to go as well. It's important to come here to have a look, but we're going to come here at the end of our story as well. It's also important to begin here because I really want to tell you that this is not National Geographic. You know, this is not actually kind of Lonely Planet, or um, but hopefully one of those stations will want to pick it up because it's a really interesting story. Um, but this is two blokes, two Jesuits, Jim McDermott and myself, Jeremy Clark, trying to tell you a story dealing with all the messiness of what it is to kind of do guerrilla filming in China. We've had people wandering around in the background, we've had traffic driving past, we've been dealing with shooting out the backseat of taxis, of buses, we've been in trains, we've been dealing with hotels, we've been dealing with all that sort of stuff. So basically, all the problems, the day-to-day -day troubles that you actually do when you're filming on the road with two blokes, a camera and a tripod. But come with us, it's, it's kind of fun, it's got its moments, and let us tell you something of that history, of the history of Richie and the Chinese Catholic Church. <laughs> This is huge in the story of Matteo Ricci and the story of the Catholic Church in China. Even though Ricci himself arrived here in the early 1580s, Jesuit presence began here earlier in about 1560 when the first Jesuits arrived to Macau. The first community, however, was not started until about 1565. In many ways we can say the story started, however, when Alessandro Valignano, the visitor to the East, the architect of the Jesuit missions in the East, arrived here in 1578. In that year he decided we had to establish a college and a presence here in Macau to actually serve the church in Japan and to serve the church in China. He immediately called Michel Ruggieri to here to this place to learn Chinese, to then go into Chinese and talk about God in China. 
immediately after, not long after, Matteo Ricci joined him. This church was not actually here when Ritchie himself lived in Macau. It was not designed until 1602 and was probably constructed and finished in the 1620s. The reason it is only a facade behind me is because it got burnt down by a fire in 1835. This complex around here consisted of a Jesuit college and this magnificent Jesuit church behind us. <laughs> So here we have on the top of the uh, Church of St. Paul's, there are various levels and as I've said, it's a sermon in stone. It's been described by many people as one of the most beautiful churches in the world, except perhaps for St. Peter's in Rome. But here we actually have, on the second level, we have four saints. We have on the, uh, over here on my right, we have the far side, that's the third general of the Society of Jesus, Francis Borgia. It might be a surprise that he's actually one of the ones listed there. At the time he was only blessed, he had not yet been canonised. But he was put up there because he gave great impetus to the missions in the East. And so he was a great supporter of the work in Japan and China. On the end, because this was the college church, the college of the Mother of God, St Paul's College, it was the college for the Jesuit missionaries and students, people who were learning about everything from science, mathematics, philosophy, all the things they would have learned back in Europe, things that they took around this region that they used in Japan, that they used in China, that they used in Cochin, China or Vietnam. Well, so this was a college, it was a school. And hence we have Blessed Aloysius Gonzaga, Louis Gonzaga, and he's the final one up there because he's the patron saint of youth and thereby also of students. Just as they were great friends in life, so too do we have reunited on the front of this church facade, we have Ignatius and his great friend Francis Xavier. There was that gospel line that Ignatius loved, which was, I have come to set fire on the earth, and how I wish it were blazing already. Well, Francis Xavier actually was the one who took that flame around the world, from Goa, through the Malaccas, to Japan, and to China. He never actually made it here, but nevertheless, his memory lives on because of the great work that he did, how he brought the society to the doorway of China, to the doorway of Macau. And so here he is remembered forever in this Sermon on Stone. Well, today we're actually trying to go to Shangchuan Island, which is also known as Sansian Island, and also known as St. John's Island. This is where Francis Xavier tried to get into China. He uh, tried to hitch a ride on a boat going up to China and um, unfortunately it didn't work. And not only did it not work, he also died in the attempt. All the boats left and he got a fever and he died. I frankly think he died of sheer exhaustion. But anyway, he died there in 1552 and that really began the whole uh, history of the endeavours of trying to get into China by the church and the missionaries, which ultimately was successful with Matteo Ricci later in 1583. But as you can see today, there's a lot of rain around. And uh, in fact, we're in the middle of a thing called Tropical Storm Goni, which has a temperature, uh, which has a predicted wind, uh, consistent wind speed of 75 kilometres an hour. An hour. Now, that's, uh, we know that uh, that's not as fast as a New York taxi. It's probably actually a little bit quicker than a Macau taxi, if I'm certainly to it. But uh, frankly, it's fast enough to stop the ferries going to Shangchuan. Uh, all the boats are in safely from the sea. They're safe in the harbour here. And uh, a lot of traffic has stopped. That's why the roads are relatively empty. People are staying at home. Shops have got their shutters uh, closed down. And uh, the ferry is, at least as we've heard, not running. But anyway, we're going to give it a go, and uh, what are our chances? Well, you know, I'm an Aussie. I think we'll give it a go anyway.
唔該問一問啊，去去聖天夏天喺邊度去啊？直海峽。今日冇船過啦，係嘛？嚇？唔知啊，喺嗰度直海峽，聖天夏天咯、啊。十幾公里到啊嚇？仲喺嗰度去啊？唔錯唔錯。We have actually made it to uh, the wharf, and uh, Shangchuan Island is actually over that way. Uh, as you can see, it's um, it's yeah, it's fair enough to say we are in a tropical storm, uh, and I think it's also probably fair to say if Noel Coward said that their dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun, I think you could probably say only ducks and um, and uh, Jesuits on pilgrimage probably come out to to this little wharf. Anyway. Uh, we tried, we did have a go. Uh, everything is locked down. We can't even get our car into the car park. We can't even go out here and actually at least gaze out at Xavier. The, the legend, of course, was that Francis Xavier was gazing out to China and never got there. Well, we're in China, but we actually can't, uh, we can't even gaze out to Shangtran at the moment. But at least we tried. And it's a reminder, actually, that of the 600 Jesuits who were sent to China, only 200 made it. They uh, died at sea because of shipwreck, died because of storms, died because of pirates and so on. So anyway, we had a go, but as you can see, <laughs> it's very wet! So here we are, we're actually in Jiao Ting, just on the outskirts, the other side of the river to where uh, Richie would have lived. And uh, we're going to a pagoda called the Wenming Pagoda, which is actually the, um, you know, the cultured, the civilised, the civilised pagoda. And it was actually built in 1588. The Jesuits were here from late 1582, we kicked out in 1583 to 1589. So what we're seeing, in fact, is something that's quite um, contemporaneous with the, the first period of Jesuit residence in in this uh, town, which was also the first period of the new stage of Christian history in China. Well, here we are at this uh, more than 400 year old temple. Uh, it was reconstructed actually only in 1996 and what's kind of ironic is that now in this place of great antiquity it's actually become a lover's message wall. All these characters and all this graffiti here next to me actually say, I love you. Now, in the context of the Ritchie story and the, the history of the Catholic Church in China, Ritchie grew to love China immensely. He loved the culture, the food, the language. He developed very deep and intimate friendships with many, many people and his contributions are greatly respected by the Chinese people. But it's fair to say he didn't grow to love Zhao Ting. This was a difficult place, a difficult post. Uh, there was the heat, the humidity, uh, there was the opposition from townsfolk who didn't want these foreigners here. They thought they were too closely linked with the Portuguese in Macau and were perhaps the outriders of a foreign invasion. Richie and Ruggieri's house was attacked Ruggieri was accused of adultery, which he was subsequently cleared from. Uh, but the constant opposition made Ritchie and Ruggieri feel really isolated, lonely and opposed. They were also disconsolate because in the whole of this time, they managed to convert one person. So they came to set the world on fire, but in fact, it seems as though their dreams were smouldering around their feet. So people here, love each other and send their messages of love, but for Richie, he didn't really end up liking, loving Zhao Ting.
the street Jeux de Pierre, or the street of the cross, the street of number 10 character, but also the street of the cross, was indeed where the first Jesuit residence was, and where we can say the modern Chinese Catholic history began. While Jiaoting was a difficult place for the early missionaries, it was nevertheless the place that Ritchie and Ruggieri realised they could make a go of it. They realised by immersing themselves in language and culture, they could become part of the Chinese scene. So it is here that Ritchie made his first world map. It is here that he wrote his first catechism, as had Ruggieri before him. And it's here too that they began to become proficient in language and culture to the extent that they became aware of what they had to do to keep moving forward. So while it was a place of loneliness, it was nevertheless a place where seeds were planted, and the seeds were planted here on this street. We're on the train from Guangzhou to Nanchang. It's, um, it's not so long as, as Chinese train rides go. It's a 14-hour train trip. We leave about 7 in the evening. We get in there at 8 the next day. We're doing hard sleeper, which is uh, a three bed bunk scenario so there are cabins of six in about a 120 person train ride uh, it's not luxurious but i find it very comfortable uh, and we're on the top bunk which gives us a chance to reflect upon what we've experienced uh, in uh, at guanghai which is near shangchuan and at Jiaoting, as we now travel to nanchang where richie really made a mark and really where the mission began to take off uh, reflecting on the journey so far, it's nice to be on a train where you don't have to worry about anything, where the people do the driving for you. Uh, it was great to be driving around Jiaoting with my brother and my niece and uh, with Jim, uh, but w when the car broke down, it certainly was a bit of a saga. Uh, we'd seen a few things, we'd done some good filming in the morning, and then the car just doesn't start. And uh, what to do? So anyway, I have to go, we had to check out, we had to go back there, there were problems with, the, with paying for the hotels. I then had to actually go and uh, get a 10 litre gallon drum of petrol. We didn't have a gallon drum, so we had to go to three petrol stations. Now the petrol station is the far side of town. At this stage, the taxi meter is tick, tick, tick. I'm thinking, my God, my budget's blown. You know, <laughs> what are we going to do? We get back to the car. We don't have anything to put it in the petrol tank. We have to think like, like Aussies and uh, solve a few things on the spot. So we get the water bottle, we do that, we pour it in. I'm smelling of petrol, my shoes are wearing petrol, I'm thinking, thank God I don't smoke. And anyway, we eventually get the thing started. So then the question is, do we what? Do we stop and look at the scenery, enjoy the view, or do we just hightail it out of Jiaoting, like Richie and the Jesuits before, and make our way basically just straight to Guangzhou, get our tickets, and wipe the dust, wipe the southern dust from our feet, and head off to Nanshan. Turns out we're heading, heading into another tropical storm, but we'll leave that for tomorrow. Tonight, I'm going to get some sleep, enjoy what we've experienced, give it up to God, and say, tomorrow's a new day. Okay. 
even though the time in the South that places like Zhao Ting and Shao Zhou were difficult for Ritchie and his companions, it nevertheless afforded them the opportunity to learn Chinese language and culture and most importantly make a few uh, significant and powerful benefactors and patrons. However, when they arrived in Nanjing, ironically at that time, Korea was invaded by Japan and China thought that Japan, the Japanese troops might also invade China. At that time, the Japanese troops, the most feared of the Japanese troops in a rather strange quirk of history, were Japanese Christian soldiers. These men had been converted by Ritchie's Jesuit confreres and here they were invading Korea and making his own movement further north all the more difficult. So they have to leave. Ritchie and his Chinese Jesuit brother, uh, Zhong Ming Ren, one of the first Chinese to join the society in 1589, they have to leave Nanjing. And this is like in the late 1594, early 1595. And they're fearful, Nanjing's fearful, they've taken on some of that fear themselves. And they hop on the boat, travelling south. Uh, the tail between their legs, they're a little bit dismayed, a little bit lonely, a little bit upset, really. Yet again, another dream just seems to have sailed on by. And anyway, they hop on the boat, it's cold, it's dark, and Richie has a vision. And in this vision, he imagines, in this vision he sees a guy who's standing there, a stranger, standing in the prow of the boat, standing next to him, someone he's never seen. And this stranger turns to him and says, hey you, Master Richie, are you the guy who's actually come here to do away with all our old traditions, our ancient ways, and bring this new message? And Richie's like, who are you? How do you know my true intentions? You know, are you the devil or are you God? And uh, the guy says to him, look, I'm not the devil. I am God. So Richie is like, well, mate, where have you been? It's been 13 really hard yards. I've sprained my ankle. My house has been attacked. I've been shipwrecked. The language is really tough and the culture is difficult. No one likes us. No one likes my message. Where have you been? And the guy says, Rich, Mateo, me mother. Go to this big city. And he shows him this vision of a big city. And Richie doesn't know it, so he presumes that it's actually maybe Beijing. And he thinks, ah, oh, great, that's where I want to go. Beijing. And the guy says, go to that city and I will be favourable to you there. Those of you, you know, those of us who know Ignatius' spirituality, well, we hear the echoes of Ignatius' own story at Lestorta when he has this vision that he goes to Jerusalem. He goes to Rome. He's been in Jerusalem already and he wants to get to Rome. And he has this vision and God says, Jesus says to him, go to Rome. I will be favourable to you there. So, Richie and Zhong Mingren, they come to Nanchang and they're where they had been really downhearted, they're now lifted up. Where they had been dismal, they're now joyous. Where they'd been fearful, they're now hope-filled. And they come to Nanchang, and there they have an amazing time of cross-cultural exchange, great friendship, mutual, mutual learning. God was favourable to them in Nanchang, and Richie believed that God would be favourable again in Beijing. Here we are at Jiujiang, uh, which is along the Zhangjiang, uh, the Yangtze River. It's a very significant port because not only does it connect the east part of the country with the inland western part by the riverway, it also connects the south with the north. People would have come up through the inland rivers like the Gan, gone through Nanchang where we've just been, and then connected uh, a little bit further east of us with the Grand Canal. And that indeed is the way that Ritchie went up to Beijing, certainly how he went to Nanjing, before he had to go back to Nanchang. And then once he was in Nanjing, a bit further east of here, he would have then taken the Grand Canal. He did take the Grand Canal up to Beijing. 
we had hoped ourselves to actually catch a boat down this mighty river, the mighty, uh, mighty Yangtze, and uh, it would have taken us down that way to Nanjing. But unfortunately, because of the importance of this port and uh, the rise of economic development, the very uh, economic strength of this port has also been its demise because it is a big export place, but it's now quicker to transport things by the very efficient roadways and trainways. So while there's a lot of traffic on the river, it's no longer tourist traffic. The tourist traffic is much further west, uh, and the only traffic that happens here is sort of intercity transportation of things like coal and sand and gravel and those sort of things, not necessarily the export goods. So sadly, while we had actually hoped to do this and meander and enjoy the sunset, unfortunately it's not actually going to occur. We're going to have to uh, get on a bus, travel about six, seven hours east, cross the river by uh, one of those mighty bridges, not the one behind us, but one like it, and we'll actually end up in Nanjing and resume Richie's story there. Nanjing. Although Ritchie had visited Nanjing in 1595 and again in 1598, he only established the first community here in 1599. He befriended many more scholar officials in Nanjing, including Xu Guangqi, whom he first met in 1599. Ritchie enjoyed the city, attracted by the charms of its scenery and pleased by the welcome he now received. The first Chinese bishop, the Dominican Luo Wenzhou, who was ordained in 1685, was in charge of this diocese. In 1688, he also ordained three Chinese Jesuits, Wu Li, also known as Wu Yushan, Lu Yunde, and Wan Qi Yuan. They were the first to be ordained in China. Wu Li was a well-known painter, regarded as one of the six masters of the early Qing period. He also wrote significant Chinese Christian poetry, among the earliest of its kind. In the 20th century, the church in Nanjing was an important centre of Catholicism, especially when the city became the nation's capital. Thus, the Nanjing community traced their roots back a long way. In the following poem, Wu Li imagines the life of the earliest Nanjing Christians as seen through the eyes of a poor fisherman. Pooang 歌坛最棒蛟龙脸晚知天许道成府
a reasonable question is to ask why did they come to Nanjing anyway, uh, as opposed to maybe going to Suzhou, or why did they go to Nanchang, as opposed to going to the clay capital, uh, Qingdezhen. And I think there's probably two main reasons for this. First of all, they were practicing what has been referred to as an apostolate by radiation, whereby they would meet scholars and they would engage in conversation and be accepted by them. And remember, they're now wearing scholarly clothing, which they donned in 1595. And having been welcomed by the scholars and befriended by them, when these scholar officials were moved to another post elsewhere throughout the empire, often they invited the Jesuits to accompany them. And so they were able to spread out and radiate out through the empire because of these relationships, these friendships they had established. The second reason I think is the most important reason. No matter how Chinese the European Jesuits had become, and remember they now had Chinese Jesuits in their number, they were still affected by their understandings they had learnt in Europe. That is, to get things done, it's good if you're near the imperial throne. So just as they had Jesuits working in the courts of France and Portugal and Spain, so too did they think they had to work in the imperial court here in China. And for them, at that time, that meant Beijing. Nanjing, therefore, was an important stepping stone. It was the old imperial city. The Ming had left here in the mid-1400s, but it still had a number of ministries which were quite significant. And so the scholars who were working here were powerful people and with good connections with the imperial court up north in Beijing. Whether or not Ritchie knew these scholars, the scholars knew him, the wise man from the west. They knew him either personally, and that's possible because of the number of people he had met in his time, or they knew him because of his writings. In 1595, he'd written a very influential book on friendship, which he had written in Nanchang. He wrote a book about memory learning and memory techniques, the famous Memory Palace, and his world map that he had produced all those years ago in Jiaoting was, had been reproduced many a time. It had even been pirated, such that this wise man from the West was well known to scholar officials. Thus, while they were happy to be here and to work here and to go out and meet scholars and continue their apostolate of conversation and radiation, Ritchie certainly still always had his eye on moving further north to Beijing. By being here, he hoped that they could indeed get to that imperial throne. Beautiful Hangzhou. Hangzhou was a very important city for the early Chinese Catholic community and particularly for the Jesuits in their midst. It was a place that they trained their men, it was a place where they printed books and in times of difficulty and persecution the Chinese Catholic community provided a safe haven for the European Jesuits. Father Paul, thank you for having us in your church. Uh, can you please tell us something about this church here, the Church of the Immaculate Conception? And one of the things that uh, people overseas are very struck by is the number of, is the growth of the church in China. And uh, how many baptisms did you have at Easter this year? Um, not many. Not many, but yeah. okay. about uh, 8, 17, or 82. 70 or 80, Tisha of Kutubasha. So not many baptisms this year, but 70 or 80 baptisms. <laughs> <laughs> and were they, were they young or were they old? Oh, most of them young. Yeah, young people. And university students? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. young people and university students. <laughs> and I believe they have to do a long catechism. Uh, on the uh, three, three months, months, or seven, seven, three months, at least three months. At least three months. Uh, so you have one year. One year? Oh, yes. About two years. Some of the two years? Okay.
one of the greatest of the early Chinese Christians, Chinese Catholics, was a man known as Zhong Ming Ren, also known as Sebastian Fernandez. He had joined the Jesuits at the end of the 1580s, early 1590s. He did his novitiate with Ritchie and another Chinese Jesuit, Huang Ming Sha, down south in Shaozhou. But then he was involved in establishing pretty much all the major communities in the early part of the 17th century and the late 16th century. He was with Ritchie at Nanchang, then at Nanjing, then at Beijing, and then finally he came down and established with Lazaro Cataneo the first community here in 1611. But he was more than just one of those early pioneers who assisted the Jesuits. He was kind of like a Jackie Chan with a bravery. I mean, this guy was imprisoned, he was shipwrecked, he was tortured. Uh, he also helped work on a, a dictionary, a Portuguese Chinese dictionary, one of the first. He dove into the turbulent rivers after one shipwreck to actually rescue their Plantan Bible, this fantastic multi-language Bible which had these beautiful pictures that Ritchie valued more than words itself because he could show the pictures to the Chinese and thereby evangelize when his language was not up to the task. John Ming Ren used to go to all the countryside and, and would visit all the people in the villages and preach to them and then the priest would come after him and baptize. So he was one of these intermediaries between the European missionaries and their neophytes, the new Catholics. He was truly a pillar of the early church, even though we remember more the Western missionaries. But when we come to a cemetery like this, I'm very conscious that a guy like Martino Martini, who's buried here, and after whom the cemetery is named, well, he was so lucky to actually be buried alongside a great like John Ming Ren. <笑><笑><笑> One Buddhist scholar who became a famous Christian of Hangzhou was a man called Yang Ting Yun, who took the name of Michael when he was baptised. He saw in the Christianity that was presented by the Jesuit missionaries a lot that was already familiar to him. In Buddhism there's daily prayer rituals and there are sets of prayer beads and the Jesuits introduced confraternities and Marian sodalities with rosaries. Uh, in Buddhism, people look after the poor in their midst, the widows, those who can't afford to pay for their funerals. And so too were the early Christians encouraged to actually practice social ministry where they would go out and help others and, and look after the poor and the destitute. One of the things that he found difficult, however, about converting to Christianity and something that was a block for some time for him and many scholar officials was the demand that he be monogamous. 
as a scholar, he was actually able to have a number of wives and did have a second wife. He asked the Jesuits, he said, where's the justice in sending away this woman who has only ever been loyal and faithful to me, who's been an intimate and chaste companion? It just doesn't seem fair or right. But anyway, he did convert, he did send her away, and that's the historical record. His conversion was very significant for the church in China as a whole because here in Hangzhou, where he was a powerful and influential scholar, he was able to protect the Jesuits during time of persecution. He gave the land upon which the church, the Church of the Saviour, the, now the Church of the Immaculate Conception, was built. And he also wrote treatises and books that defended Christianity against attacks from other scholars. So much so that Yang Ting Yun, Michael Yang Ting Yun, is known as one of the three pillars of the Chinese church. The church would not be here today if he had not converted. But we re when we remember him and all his great acts, I think it is indeed only just to recall that faceless, nameless woman who bore the cost of his conversion.
for just over 100 years after Ruji Eri and Ritchie began their mission in the south at Zhao Qing, European missionaries who came to China after them continued to have to leave from Portugal. They left on Portuguese ships and they were under the authority of the Portuguese throne. That all changed, however, in the 1680s when the King of France, Louis XIV, decided to send six Jesuit missionaries on a scientific mission to the East. They were going to use their scientific expertise for the glory of his throne, and they were going to work as religious missionaries in China to further the Kingdom of God in the East. His bold move of sending these missionaries without any reference to Portugal effectively broke the Portuguese monopoly on the way that missionaries could travel to the East. So much so that in the century afterwards, there were other French congregations that traveled to China. Such people as, for instance, the Vincentians and the Paris Foreign Missionary Society. The members of those missions, those French missions who died in Beijing, were buried northwest of here at a place called the Zhengfu Temple. The stones you see all around me here are all that remains of that Christian cemetery. Working for the Imperial Court was not a soft and cushy job. The hours were long, the missionaries often felt lonely and put upon, and the political intrigues could be deadly. After all, Adam Schaal had died as a result of one. One man, one man who is well known was the French Jesuit brother, Jean Denis Attiré, who was a painter for the emperors. He followed the emperor on a number of journeys and his paintings have become famous. So much so you can find them in museums in Europe as well as in China. He willingly self-effaced himself. That is, he willingly used his gifts and talents in a way that for him was tedious, dull and boring. In a letter that has subsequently become famous, he said, Here I am, chained as though from one son to another. I have to paint only what the emperor wants according to his taste and characteristics, and they're not my tastes. I have a thousand other encumbrances that would be too tedious to tell you. And for what? What am I given for this? Merely a few bolts of silk and cloth. I would willingly go back to Europe were it not that I thought that my brush was used for the good of religion and enabled the missionaries elsewhere to preach it. That's the only reason I stay here in this place. That poignant quotation from a letter from Jean Denis Attiré is picked up in some strange way by these tombstones, these memorial stones around me, because they are silent witnesses to the lives of more than 30 missionaries both Chinese and European, Vincentian and Jesuit, who worked for the church in the 18th and 19th centuries in China. It's a witness because, as in the case of Atiray's stone here, while we can make out his name, we can't make out the name of the Society of Jesus, and we certainly can't make out the Chinese history that tells the same story, the story of Atiray's humble and willing service. This tombstone is a reminder that the Chinese church has been built on just such self-effacing service. The early Jesuits' dream of travelling to the end of the world is most personified by Francis Xavier. His demise off the coast of China in 1552, however, did not mean that the early Jesuit dream of re-establishing the church in China also died. Rather, in one of those quirks of history, the man most synonymous with the early Jesuit mission in China, Matteo Ricci, actually was born in the same year that Xavier died. Just before his own death, after about 28 years in China, Matteo Ricci said to those gathered around him in 1610, he said something like, I leave you before an open door. 
through which lie many challenges and a road fraught with great difficulties. The thousands of women and men, the missionaries who came to China in the years since, certainly face many challenges, as have the hundreds and thousands and millions of Chinese Catholics and Chinese Christians in these centuries as well. Now, about 400 years later, the church is still faced with challenges and difficulties. For instance, how do they remain true to the spirit of the gospel in such a rapidly changing society and culture? How do they negotiate such things as ongoing formation programs or international exchanges with the numerous and varied government agencies and bodies that actually are responsible for religious affairs? More importantly, how do they share their story? How do they go through the open door and talk about the experiences they've had in these past centuries? How do they talk of their joys and their hopes, their griefs and their anxieties? They're not the only ones who face a challenge, of course. You and I also have to consider, are we able to stop and leave aside our preconceptions about the Chinese church, about Chinese history in general, and listen to the voices, heed those voices of the China church, this generous people and this storied community.